So kind of starting again, have you learned something new? Try something different. I'm gonna be talking about the exposure triangle, the implications and examples. So, you know, why did I choose these settings on, uh, on a particular image? So the reason to get out of, uh, out of uh, program mode is you get to control the, the overall exposure. Um, you get to control the amount of motion blur, um, whether you want no motion blur or a little bit, um, you control that with the shutter speed, the depth of field. So how much of, um, you know, your, it, is your subject in, um, in focus as well as the background in focus or is the subject in focus? And then the, um, the background is nice and, uh, nice and blurry. You can control that. And that is also the separation, what's called separation of the, uh, the subject from the background. So you can direct also what the viewer's eye is drawn to. So the viewer's eye is gonna be drawn immediately to what is critically sharp. Um, so that may not be the center of the screen, but you get to control it or center of the image. You control that by what you have uh, in focus and how much you separate um, your subject from the, the background. Your camera also thinks that all black bears and polar bears are gray. So, uh, you know, if you have a, a black bear uh, in the dark, it's gonna kind of look like a gray bear, a gray bear in, uh, you know, kind of mid, mid afternoon because it's, it's going to overexpose because the camera in P mode is gonna think, oh, it's supposed to be what's called 18% gray. So it's gonna overexpose the image. If you're shooting a polar bear on, uh, on snow, it's gonna say, wow, that's really overexposed. And it's gonna make it look like a gray bear on cement, right? So, um, you know, I, 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 lots of people say they shoot stuff and it's overexposed or underexposed. They don't know what's wrong with their camera. Well, their camera's actually working properly. Um, they just don't understand what the camera is trying to do. And that's to make everything basically um, a, a middle gray. Does that make sense to everyone? Don't you know? Uh, feel free to interject with questions. Here's a, a, a very quick chart to give you a sense. Um, so when we're talking, first of all, with aperture, the bigger the number, the smaller the hole, and the smaller the hole, the less light that comes in. So you're looking, you know, as you go to the right from f32 down to f1.4. Um, that is basically a bigger hole, lets in more light. Um, I, I always found it kind of counterintuitive that the bigger the number, uh, the smaller the hole. I would have thought, you know, the bigger the hole, the bigger the number, but it, it's the opposite. Then when you go shutter speed and you see the example there, one one thousandth, it's nice and sharp. You go down to you know a half second. The person uh, running by is is basically a, a blur. And then on the bottom ISO, which is the sensitivity of either your film or your sensor, the bigger the number for your ISO, uh, the more noise that you're going to get. So more noise, or the other term people often use is grain. So you can see the example in this slide. Um, the, the lower the number, basically the better the image quality, but in order to get, um, you know, with the, the shutter speed and aperture you choose to get the right exposure, sometimes you have to turn up your ISO. That introduces a bit more, um, a bit more grain or, uh, or noise. So that's just kind of a summary of what those three things are and very briefly what the implications of them are. So the aperture, the lower the number, the bigger the opening. So f2.8 is the typical maximum or largest um, size aperture for most sports lenses. So all the lenses that I own are, are 2.8 is as large as they go. You'll often see a 1.2 or a 1.8 um, on portrait lenses. Um, you're not going to see big, like big long sports lenses at uh, 1.2 or, or 1.8. Um, it's just, uh, they would be astronomically expensive. I think the, um, the biggest aperture that I've seen is a 0.95 and it's a manual focus lens from Nikon and it's like $15,000 or something stupid like that. 
So the larger apertures are referred, the larger aperture lenses are referred to as fast. And the reason for that is when you have a nice big hole, nice big opening, then it lets in a lot of light. So therefore you don't need to have the, sh the apertures or the shutter open longer in order to get a proper exposure. So a big opening means that you can take a faster picture. So the faster the lens, typically the more expensive it is. So, you know, like my, um, um, I have, you know, like if, if you go with like a five, six lens, which is, you know, kind of typical of uh, say a kit lens, it might be a few hundred dollars. Whereas my 2.8 lenses, even my smallest one, this one that I've, I've got, this one, um, even that one is uh, like, three and a half thousand dollars for, for a, a 2.8 lens. The term shooting wide open means using the largest aperture available. Some of your, ca the cameras, uh, the, the lenses that you have, some, some of you might have a 1.8, 2.8, um, some might be a four, five, six, whatever. So shooting wide open refers to the biggest hole or the smallest aperture number uh, available for your equipment. So the aperture affects what's called depth of field. So depth of field is basically, um, uh, it's basically how deep the area that is in focus is. So if you have a very, very shallow depth of field, you might be taking someone's portrait, their eye is going to be sharp, but their ear is going to be out of focus. Um, if you're taking a, a group shot, for example, um, with, you know, two rows of people or, you know, the family, um, you're going to want a um, big, uh, sorry, a, a larger aperture number, like an F8 or something like that, because that gives a bigger depth of field. So that means the people in the front row and the back row would be in focus. Um, if you're doing an individual portrait, you might want to go with, you know, 1.2, 1.8, 2.8, something like that. So you get that nice blurring effect as you go away from, you know, the, the critically sharp um, eyes. Does that make sense to everyone? All good? Okay. Shutter speed. The faster the shutter, the less light that hits the sensor. It's, it's you know, simple physics. If it's open for a second, you're going to get a second's worth of light. It's open for half a second, half a second worth of light. So in order to get the proper exposure, it's really a balance of the shutter speed, the aperture, and the ISO. So one eight hundredth of a second or faster is typical um, to freeze most sport action. So I normally shoot at one 1250th of a second or faster, depending on the sport. Um, 800 is about as slow as you wanna go, unless you're, you're really trying to introduce motion blur. So the, the rule of thumb, your shutters, your minimum shutter, sh shutter speed should be one over the focal length if, if it's handheld. So if you're hand holding a camera, and your, um, your focal length is 80 millimeters, then the minimum uh, shutter speed that you should use is 1 80th of a second. It's, it's a general rule of thumb. If you're really steady, um, you can go a little bit slower, but you, know, you, you have the risk of motion blur, even just pushing the, um, uh, pushing the, the shutter release um, uh, can cause some, some camera shake. So last night I was shooting um, uh, the cityscape as well as the, the full moon. And I was using um, a lens from Nikon. I was at 1100 um, millimeters. So just pushing the, uh, the shutter release caused so much shake that the moon looked like it was wobbling. So I had to use, well, obviously I'm using a tripod because I could barely lift the, uh, the lens. Um, but uh, I used a timed exposure so I could hit the button, let the camera settle down and wait five seconds before it actually um, activated. But, um, so again, um, one over the focal length for your minimum shutter speed. 
So a, tri a tripod essentially eliminates the camera shape, but not motion blur. Um, if everyone understands that a camera shake is basically me wobbling when I'm trying to hold the camera. Motion blur is I could be perfectly still, but the, you know, someone's running across the, the, uh, the frame. Um, that's motion blur. When if you have a sh slow shutter speed and they're running across, you, you'll see uh, some blur um, of, of the person. A slow shutter speed helps depict movement. So if you are, for example, taking a picture of a, a race car, so the example of this weekend, you could shoot at you know, an 8,000th of a second, even though they're going like 300 kilometers an hour, you shoot at 8,000th of a second, it's gonna look like that car is parked. So there's gonna be no motion in the wheels. It's gonna look exactly like um, the car is parked. So if you go with a, a slower shutter speed, and you know, pan with uh, with the uh, with the car, you will get some motion blur in the wheels, which is what you want to depict um, a certain amount of of movement. So the answer is not always just use a super high shutter speed to freeze all the action. So ISO is essentially the uh, sensitivity setting for the sensor. So the higher the ISO setting, the more sensitive the light becomes. So you can fix the shutter speed and aperture and change your ISO setting. And the higher you go, the brighter your picture will be. But again, it will in introduce a bit more noise or grain. The higher the ISO setting, the more noise or grain you'll get. Ideally, you wanna use the lowest ISO setting as practical. So, um, you know, different cameras will handle um, high ISO differently. Um, I sold my, uh, my Nikon D5 yesterday. It was probably, it was by far the best camera I had in terms of um, um, high SO uh, performance. So I sold that one off yesterday. Sad to see it go, but um, anyway, like I, I could literally shoot at, I think I've shot at like um, 51,000 and change, whatever the number is, and uh, still got usable pictures with, uh, with that camera. My older, you know, a 12 year old uh, Nikon D300S at 6400 ISO, the pictures were garbage. I wouldn't even bother taking pictures with that older camera. On a sunny day, you might use ISO 100. Um, I don't know what the minimum is for your camera. They, they, they typically vary. I think my standard low setting is um, 80. Um, other cameras, 100 or 125 might be the lowest ISO. But on a sunny day, um, you know, you, you'll want to go as low as you can with the ISO um, to get the, the uh, least amount of noise or grain. On an overcast day, you might bump it up to 640. If you're shooting sports, you might shoot at, you know, 2000 or something like that. But again, you want to balance the shutter speed, the aperture, and the ISO. And I'll talk about that in a couple of minutes. Shooting sports indoors, it's not uncommon where I'm shooting at ISO 5000 or ISO 6400. Um, that, you know, the, my cameras can handle that. So. so here, do we have any questions going on? Sorry, I, it's, we've had a little snafu with the, um, um, with the Zoom. So it's, it's harder to uh, uh, solicit questions, but... Um, Okay, I'll a question. A question from Laura. Yeah. Would you ever set your ISO to auto on cloudy days to compensate for the quick change in conditions? Like if it's a windy, cloudy day and yeah, the yeah. you know you're shooting outdoors and yeah. suddenly it's overcast okay. and it's then it's sunny. Would yeah. you ever just set your ISO to auto so that you're not having to? Yeah. Excellent try? question. Um, it is, it's, it's, you know, I don't, it's not a standard reply. That's a very good question. Um, it depends. And the reason it depends is if I'm shooting um, a, uh, a soccer game, for example, and one team is wearing black jerseys and the other team is wearing white jerseys, I come back to the polar bear and the black bear. If I'm shooting and the, and the camera is metering off of the black jersey, it's gonna go, wow, this is underexposed. It's really dark, so I'm gonna overexpose the image. So it's gonna crank up the ISO. You immediately take, you know, the light doesn't change, but then you immediately take a picture of the white jersey 
And it's like, whoa, this is really bright. And it's going to underexpose the image. So it depends on what I'm shooting. If I was shooting landscape, then yeah, absolutely. Set it to auto ISO. If I'm shooting architecture or something, yeah, absolutely. But if I'm shooting, which is typically what I'm doing, is shooting sports, um, I've run into too many issues with, I'll take a burst of images and I'll get different ISO settings from image to image in a series. And it's just too much work to try and make them look the same. So I'm not a fan of auto ISO when I'm shooting sports. Does that make sense? Does it help, Laura? Sorry, I couldn't unmute. Yes, that's that's oh. helpful. Thank you. Okay. So sorry, but the answer is it depends. <laughs> I don't, I don't uh, to be honest, I don't use auto ISO often. Yeah. All right. So how the exposure triangle works. Um, if the shutter speed gets faster, the aperture must open, right? Because shutter speed, it's open for less time, not as much light is coming in. So you got to make that hole bigger or you've got to increase the sensitivity of the ISO. So it's really, you know, think of it as, um, um, you know, you have to adjust one or two if you're changing a third, right? Um, so, you know, it's, it's, it's basically a balance to get the right exposure. So if the ISO gets lower, either the aperture must open or the, the shutter speed lowers. If the aperture closes, so you go to a higher aperture uh, number, the shutter speed must be reduced to allow the, the uh, shutter to be open longer and or the ISO must in, be increased to allow uh, the sensor to capture more light. So here's that idea, um, that 18% gray. So this comes back to your auto ISO. If you are relying on your camera to do the metering, your camera will think that a polar bear on snow will look like a gray bear on cement because it will be underexposed. A black bear in a forest will look like a gray bear because it'll be overexposed. So just remember, but if you are, for example, um, uh, shooting um, auto ISO, but you're, you're outside, so you're, you know, you're shooting a lot of uh, snow, um, you got you can tell your camera, hey, this is supposed to be overexposed and you can set something called your exposure compensation. So you're basically overriding or telling, uh, telling your camera go a third of a stop faster or a third of a stop more. That's starting to get a little bit more complicated. But, um, your camera's meter doesn't really know what you're shooting. So um, again, I come back to shooting the team with the black jerseys and the, and the white jerseys. I will set my exposure, my, um, uh, my shutter speed, aperture and ISO, and I will lock it. So the camera doesn't change settings if I'm shooting the, uh, the kid in the black jersey or the kid in the white, uh, white jersey. So if you put, photograph a person with light skin, it will be likely underexposed. Um, and, and conversely, if you uh, photograph a person with darker, a darker complexion, the camera will overexpose it because it'll try and make that dark skinned person a you know, medium skinned person. And the white skinned person, it's gonna try and make a medium skin uh, colored person and make them both uh, you know, incorrect exposures. Uh, I think it's, yeah, there, or dark skin, there we go. So general tips. With portraits and landscapes, use a lower shutter speed because that will allow you to use a lower ISO. Um, and the portrait, they're not moving, right? They're, they're typically standing still. With sports, use a faster shutter speed. Like I said, I typically shoot at, at 1250th or faster. Um, speed up the shutter speed if you're hand holding. Um, you don't want the, the camera shake. Uh, lower the, I, the, the lower the ISO, typically the, the, the better the image in terms of the amount of uh, noise or grain. Uh, the larger aperture, so the lower the uh, F number, the more light that comes in. Larger aperture, more blurred background. So um, I, I touched on that earlier. If you're using something like a, a 2.8, your subject is going to be um, in focus. Your background will be blurred. 
it's uh, it's it's something called BOCA. I'll, I'll talk about that in a couple of minutes. Um, so you know, know your camera. So know how to change. You know, your exposure is basically the balance of the shutter speed, the aperture, and the ISO. Your color is controlled by the white balance. Typically, you're, you're, if you're using P mode, you're also using auto white balance. Um, changing the white balance setting in your camera is kind of a different, you know, the, the subject of a, a, another discussion. Um, if you're using a Nikon or a Sony camera, use your AFC, so continuous focus mode for those. I think it's called AI Servo for, for Canon um, if you're shooting action and AFS for uh, Nikon or Sony for, for portraits. The difference between those, so AFC means continuous focus. So as the person or subject moves, your camera will keep, keep moving the focus and keep that subject in focus. You don't wanna do that for a stationary um, object like a portrait or a mountain because your camera is expecting motion. Um, if it's holding still, your camera gets confused. So that's where you wanna use AF S and S is for single, so it's not continuous. Um, if I'm shooting sports, I'm typically in burst mode. I also use back button focus. So I've separated the function of um, the focus and shutter release on my shutter button. Um, my focus button is um, operated by my thumb. Um, so independently of the, um, uh, of the shutter release button. And that gives me control of what, what I'm focusing and where I'm focusing. So just, just some examples. You see that there are some example pictures here that I'm taking. So here, for example, I, I was using my trusty Nikon D5 um, with a 300 2.8. So look at how blurry that background is. Even the player behind these, these three is, is really quite blurry. So what this does is it immediately takes your eye away from the background and focuses it on these, these three players. I'm um, shooting at 3.2 to give a slightly bigger uh, depth of field than if I use 2.8. And uh, ISO 1000 uh, 1, because the, the lighting was kind of variable in the, in the stadium because of clouds. Um, so I stepped it up a fair bit. And then on the fly, I would move it up to uh, ISO 6400. So there is zero motion blur in this picture. So in 6400th of a um, of a second, that you know the the guy, even though he's running at full speed, you know he moved like a couple of millimeters, uh, you know, for um, at that uh, short short a distance or a short a time span. Uh, sorry, did I not have? Uh, there we go. So this one, Nikon D5, 300, 2.8, um, F2.8, ISO 200. So the D5 was, was excellent with higher ISO. So 200 is, is you know, just fine. And the reason I wanted 2.8 is I wanted a super shallow depth of field because the, the background was ugly. There were garbage cans and fences and, and stuff like that. So I got really low. You can see in this, this picture, this is me literally on my stomach and shooting up so that I don't get any of the fence and stuff like that. But I really wanted to separate. You can see how the, um, the athlete is in focus, whereas the background is, is just a complete blur, which um, again, separates the, uh, uh, the person and therefore directs you as the viewer, it directs your eye to the athlete. That's where I shot it. Um, this one, 6400, uh, 2.8, ISO 500. It was, uh, I wanted to go nice and fast. Um, and, uh, you know, ISO again, ISO 500 for a Nikon D5 is, is nothing. Uh, this one, 1250 of a second, F2.8, ISO 5000. Why did I go with that? Shallow depth of field, so 2.8, shot wide open. 1250th of a second is my sweet spot for freezing the, uh, the action. So those water drops are like frozen. And ISO 5000 is the setting that I use inside the uh, Toronto Pan Am Center because it's not 
overly bright unless you turn the broadcast lights on in there. This one also in the T uh, uh, Toronto Pan Am Center. Um, I turned the ISO up on this one to 6400. I kept the 1250th and 2.8. Um, I did not want to go slower, so I upped the ISO because on the, on the um, west side of the pool, away from the windows, it's a bit darker. So I uh, made this a little bit brighter uh, by upping the ISO. This one, um, a 2.8, uh, 1250 of a second, 2.8 ISO 6400. This is a pool in uh, Barrie. Um, so turned up the, the ISO, you know, fairly high because it's not all that bright in that pool. This one, I just kind of threw this one in. This one was, uh, this was taken with strobe lights. So I'm kind of cheating on this one. This one was taken middle of the afternoon. So probably around two o'clock full sun in my backyard. So right behind my son are, you know, a, a, a bunch of cedars. Uh, you don't see them because what I did was I set my um, uh, shutter speed to very fast, turned the ISO down as low as it would go. And I stepped down the aperture to basically let in pretty much no light. And then I put a strobe just um, off each one of its shoulders. So he's, uh, he's lit with two very powerful lights, like eight inches from his face. So this is what you get with the ability to control the light. This one also similarly was uh, mid afternoon. So she's in full sunlight. Um, and what I did, and, and as is the backyard, but I closed down the aperture, or sorry, I, I um, set the, uh, the ISO nice and low, um, a very, you know, uh, ISO 60th. I, um, so it's, I went with this, that can't be right. It's not an ISO, uh, I think that's a 1600th of a second. Sorry about that. Um, but I have two, two very powerful strobes just off to uh, camera left to light her face. But what I did was I exposed, um, set the camera exposure to make the background nice and dark. Um, and then her nice and bright. So really I'm, I'm cheating there because a, a, a lit image with strobes is really two different exposures, but that's you know, kind of a more, I'm giving this as an example of what can be done once you start understanding the exposure triangle. This one also nice and dark background, um, 800th of a second, ISO 400. So this gym was like a cave. So I actually have three strobe lights on this guy to light him as I've done. Um, this is a quick video. I'm, I'm hoping it'll play okay. I'm actually taking the video and you're gonna see another photographer take, uh, take a photo and watch, um, watch for the strobe. So I've slowed this down, ready, click. So that's where he shot. Right, so you can see how it's kind of flat lighting. This was my image. So what I did was I, I spent like 20 minutes figuring out the exposure to get a really dramatic, nice dark sky, very moody sky. And then I lit him with three strobes. So there's one strobe on the left, two on the right um, of, uh, of the, the rider. This also um, a strobe off to the right. So I've exposed for the sky and lit the girl, um, girl's face with uh, strobe lights. Um, what did I do here? A four thousandth of a second, really low ISO, but I went super fast, even though the guy wasn't moving because this was a commercial image for Titleist. So no one cares what his shoes look like. Um, so the shoes are, are, are blurry. So I wanted a very shallow depth of field. So if you look kind of a, you know, a couple of centimeters in front of the ball and a couple of centimeters behind the ball, you can see that it's blurry. You can see the plane of where it's in focus. And that is specifically the Titleist logo. So that was a commercial image for, uh, for Titleist. This one I shot at F22. So I really stepped it down 
because we wanted the front of the shoe and the back of the shoe, the whole shoe, um, pardon me, we wanted in focus. So a very large depth of field. And because the shoes aren't moving and I'm lighting this with strobes, I did a 200th of, uh, of a second, a low ISO, so no grain and F22 to get that massive uh, depth of field to keep the whole thing in focus. This one, 1600 of a second, ISO, 60, uh, ISO 640 again with that camera, it's no issue. 2.8 to get a nice shallow depth of field. Same thing here. Um, sorry, that also would be a 1250th of a second. 2.8, you can see how blurred the background is. So you don't, you're not distracted by the faces of the people in the, in the stands. You can make out that this is a, the first base umpire, but your focus goes to the, uh, to the pitcher. Here, um, 1600th of a second, I, I brightened it up. It was getting a little late in the, uh, in the evening. Um, so 1600th of a second freezes the motion. So this is, Mookie Betts um, hitting, and then this is Mookie Betts, same game. Um, I'm in this one, I'm in the third base press well. Same, I'm sorry, same thing. This would be a 1600th or a 1250th of a second to get that crisp um, freezing of the action, but a nice blurry background. Um, Jeff, there's a question. Yeah. From Jessica. I know depth of field gets shallower and wider regardless of the aperture, depending on your distance from the subject. Yeah. How does that work and how do you compensate? Um, a good question. So I'll go back. Um, I'll go back here. <coughs> so here, um, I am 400 and something feet away from, uh, from Mookie Betts. Yeah. So my depth of field is like what is in focus is a good few feet, even at 2.8. Um, but if I'm shooting, because the difference between 450 feet and 453 feet is what, like, you know, 0.00% or 0.01% of, of the distance. But if I'm five feet away from, from him, the difference between five feet and eight feet is, is huge. So your depth of field gets bigger the further away you get from your subject. Um, so if I am shooting, um, if I come back to these shoes, for example, I'm like three feet away from these shoes when I'm shooting them. So I need to go ISO, or sorry, um, uh, F22 to get a, a larger depth of field. If, he, if these shoes were 400 feet away, I could have shot at F1.2 uh, and gotten the whole thing in focus. So the further away you are from the, uh, from the subject, um, the further you are away from the subject, um, the larger the, the depth of field will become. Does that make sense? Does that help, Jessica? Yeah. Yeah. Good question. So another one. 2.8, make the background nice and blurry. I, I, you know, my typical, my recipe for images is typically I'm shooting at 2.8. I like the look of the uh, low note backgrounds, like the, the blurry backgrounds. You know, I'm focused on her eyes here. So like literally your eyes are gonna go when you're looking at this picture, you're gonna look at her face and her eyes. You see the title is and- Definitely sharing your screen. Oh, sorry. Mm -hmm. oh, sorry. This one, um, so you're gonna look here and you're gonna see the eyes and, and Titleist. Again, I'm shooting for them. So, um, you know, we want that in focus. And then the, uh, the marsh in the background, the, the pond, you don't see it. Like it's just a, a nice blurry, creamy background. Um, this one, uh, this was lit with strobes too. So what I did was I set my exposure to get a nice blue sky. And then we, um, uh, we added a strobe light over here, to camera, uh, camera left, to light the, um, to light the trophy. Uh, this one, a nice uh, shallow, uh, fairly shallow depth of field to get his face and his degree. This was my son, one of two or three times in 
my life, he's let me take his picture. Um, and there's a strobe light, um, there's strobe lights left and right, because uh, he's in the shade. So I wanted to light him. But uh, if I did this with natural light, either I, I have a choice of exposing correctly for him and the, the background would be um, overexposed. Um, but here I set my correct exposure and then added lights to light him properly. That's it for me. Any questions? Does that help? Did that, Sorry. Did that help? Oh, hey, Jeff, it's Roy. Uh, that snap you had of the swimmer in the pool, what focal length were you using? I assume it's a higher zoom lens. Uh, this one? The swimmer with his arms oh. open with the goggles. Is there that shot there? This one? Yeah. Uh, that's a 300 to eight. 300, great. Thank you. Yeah. So when I'm shooting swimming, I, I use, like, I typically use a 300 or a 400. Yeah. To end a two eight, right? Because you know the, this background look. You know, like you got official standing there, but you don't see them. Like that's actually an official standing here. You can't tell. Your eyes drawn directly to his face. I guess to get that shot, you're doing like very rapid shots to, to freeze that particular moment. I could take it. Uh, yeah. Well, you know, with a D five, it's fourteen frames a second. Right. Right. Okay. So you know, I. You know, my rule, uh, rules for sports photography, shoot early. So if you wait for peak, peak action to shoot, you've missed it. Right, right. Get low, um, right? So, and, and you know, you want the eyes, right? So shoot early, shoot low. Um, you, you managed to capture some really strong, great frames. That's amazing work. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, so the, the D5, uh, maximum shut uh, the maximum frames per second was uh, 14. My new Nikon, I can shoot uh, full JPEG 30 frames a second, or smaller JPEGs, I can shoot 120 frames a second. So, you know, that elusive baseball on the bat contact shot, you know, you could go years and not actually get the moment um, where the ball is on the bat. Um, but at 120 frames a second, you're kind of doing it with every batter. Same with golf. Like it's like cheating now because I can, uh, every, every single golf shot, I can get like the impact and then the ball launching yeah. kind of like cheating, but I don't tell my clients that. No. no. Saved by technology. <laughs> Might as well use it. Yeah. So here is, uh, like here are some of the action shots. Still seeing this? Okay. Yep. Yeah. So it's like Rory McIlroy, and because my new camera is mirrorless, yeah, I can shoot during the backswing. Yeah. So this is me laying beside the TV camera inside the boards um, at the Canadian Open a few weeks ago. Yeah. This is me. My assignment for Golf Canada was to shoot the crowds. So this is, I'm, I'm actually backed away. So you've got a, a fairly wide shot. And obviously this is Rory McIlroy, but the purpose of the shot for Golf Canada was to show the crowd. So that's why this is backed away here. Nice and tight, nice and tight, really tight, but look at the background. So this was shot with a, a, um, a 300. Uh, and not cropped very much. So that background, like the, the audience at the south end of uh, BMO Field, is quite far away. So it's just one big blur. So your eyes go directly to uh, Josie Altador here. There's Alex. Uh, any others? That's my son again here. Mm. Anyway, that's uh, good, man. Let's see. Here's some of the commercial stuff. This was fun this was last month, Adam Levine and Flo Rida. So, man. <laughs> so I, I tried to tag Flo Rida in uh, Instagram. And what happened? It's Florida. <laughs> so I'm going like Flo Rida. And I'm thinking, wow, he's probably, well, wait a minute. It's Florida. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, a little bit of an idiot. Oh, here's, here's an interesting one. Any idea on this one, how I did this? Any guesses? 
Mm. That's a 10 second exposure. So what we what I did was I taped um, little light sticks to her tennis racket in a completely blacked out studio. Like we even covered up the ex the, the fire exit signs, so there was zero light. So you pre-focus, you turn the lights out, and then she starts swinging her racket after I open the uh, open the shutter, swings her racket, and then she gives a signal. She goes, "Yep," throws the ball in the air, and I fired the uh, fired the strobe um from a from a remote so this is a 10 second exposure so you see all the you know the, the swinging of the racket but she's properly exposed and frozen because she was hit with like a ten thousandth of a second of uh light from the strobes anyway, Solid, that's just what Solid. you can do when you understand how to control the uh control the light this was lit with two strobes this one here this was lit with strobes yeah. Otherwise, either the background is is really really dark and uh, get him proper exposure, but I want proper exposure on the back and him, so that was lit with uh, the strobes, no strobes, lots of strobes, no strobes. <laughs> That's it for me. Oh, Any questions? Any questions? In the chat, like the big question is, was this helpful? Like, did you learn anything? Oh yeah, yeah. I think oh, help yeah. for like motion. Um, cause like a couple of the shots I did last weekend because the person's were in motion, you get that blur. I mean, if you can avoid it a little bit, then I'm going to try. Yeah. Does anybody have any questions about their own photos? If you want to share some. I, I have a question, but I don't want to, not about my photos. I wanted um, to ask Jeff when, when we go and do some of these meetups and we do like, um, uh sunset we have time to check our settings and take some pictures and see what works and what doesn't when you're doing like action photography like that is it just that you're so good that you know exactly what the settings should be or do you test it out on the first few people that go by till you get my my, my recipe is you know for most of the stuff like so here i'll show you what um like you can see who i shoot for NFL, Golf Canada, Maple Leaf Sports, swimming, soccer. Um, so, you know, you can kind of see what I'm shooting. Um, so, you know, my recipe is usually a 12 50th of a second or faster, um, F2.8. And then I figure out what ISO I need. So most of my pictures, like all my swimming pictures are 12 50th of a second, 2.8. And then I know that um, the Toronto Pan Am Center is typically 5,000 ISO, 6,400 at night when there's no uh, light from outside. The East Bayfield Center in uh, Barrie is, is 6,400. Um, you know, but if I go to BMO Field, you know, it's going to depend on right? like how much cloud there is. But I'll set a 1250th, 2.8, and then just change my ISO to get the right exposure. So when you first started, was there some trial and error? Um, yeah, you know, like I, you know, like it, it's, it's not uncommon for someone to say, okay, I want to freeze the action. So you go to like a 5,000th of a second. Well, you do that. Yeah, you've, pardon me, you've frozen the action, but you really needed to crank up the ISO um, or your camera automatically, you know, moved up the ISO and you get a lot of grain. Well, you can step it down to a 1250th of a second and lower the, uh, the ISO and you get less noise in, uh, in the image. Right. So okay. here, I'm gonna show um, here. So I was, I'm gonna come back here. So I was tinkering last night and the night before. So this, if I look here, this is a, a shutter speed of 400. It's on a tripod. Five six was the um, maximum aperture because it was a it was an eight hundred millimeter five point six lens from Nikon. So uh, you see here eight hundred, but it's on a tripod, um, and I did um, uh, uh, or, um, a timed release. So I hit the button, and then moved moved away from the camera, and five seconds later it took the exposure. But here, depth of field, you know, it's it's 34, 
uh, it was at 34,000 kilometers away from us. So, you know, the depth of field is actually, I don't know how well it shows through here, but like this moonscape is, uh, is, is pretty detailed. It was a lot of fun. Did you submit it to NASA yet? What's that? Did you send that to NASA yet? No, I'm sure they have bigger. Nah. <laughs> uh, and then this one, this one I'm shooting, it was, uh, focal length was 1360 because I put a 1.4 teleconverter on the 800. So this, this camera weighed like 40 pounds, um, but it actually isn't very sharp. So I, 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 you know, like I look at this one, it's not nearly as sharp as with the 800 without the teleconverter. But this is the, uh, the CN Tower at 1360. Um, that was five seconds. So it actually allows the light to, um, you know, cause it, it kind of moves, if you will, you know, they have the light shows. So this allows the whole thing to be, uh, to be lit. So this is straight out of, this image is straight out of the camera. So that there's no cropping on this. This was taken from basically my front yard. Jeff? Yes. Jeff, it's Pat. I'm just looking, it's a little blurry your, um, uh, your zoom, what kind of zoom lens did you use on that? Uh, on this? Uh, no, the, the, sorry, it was the, um, the moon. The moon? This, yeah, it's blurry, so I, I, I don't like it. Um, like but your one. lens, what lens? Because I can't read it. It's, oh, it's, it's, it's an 800 millimeter uh -huh. with a 1.4 teleconverter. So the uh, focal length, your focal length is 1360. So it's massive. And your lens? That, that's, no, that's, that's the lens, a 1300 millimeter lens. Wow. Yeah, Pat, I wouldn't recommend trying dropping that on your foot. Oh my God. I had a phone. Oh, yeah, like I'm, I'm not kidding. Like it's, it's like 40 pounds. Oh, I believe it. Yeah. That's a beautiful shot. Beautiful. Well, this one, this one's not very sharp. So this was last night. Um, and, you know, it, it was a little earlier. Unfortunately, the, the largest full moon of the year was uh, two nights ago. But it was, uh, it was cloudy until about 1230 at night, like where the moon was, you couldn't see it until about 1230. So that was this. So this is much, much sharper because you can see the focal length is 800 millimeters. So it's, it's an 800 millimeter prime. So it's not a, not a zoom. Wow. So if I go here, there we go. That's, and that's straight out of the camera, this one. Wow. That's so, amazing quality. Yeah. yeah. So this is, this is just me tinkering. I think I took the teleconverter off. So if I go here, yeah, you can see that there's a little bit, yes. But like, look at the- uh, Amazing, amazing. Like wow. Look at, you know. So wow. you know, obviously that I'm not gonna go, I'm gonna do something like this. There we go. Like, you know, the, the, uh, the detail in the landscape is, is pretty uh, awe-inspiring. No, like you see the, the different color of light. Like this is straight out of the camera and it's, it's black and white. And then this was last night and it's very red. Beautiful. So I do have one other question. It's not related to this uh, one, but you talked about the back button focus. Uh -huh. So um, could you just quickly go over that just quickly again? Uh, yeah, I'm looking. I don't have a camera here. Um, they're all no, sorry. They're but all the backwards. purpose, the back button focus sets it. Could you just? Yeah. So, what um, you know, normally oh, when you depth know, of field preview when, or something, depth of field preview. When, when you get a camera, you press halfway down on the shutter release button, and that starts the the, the your focus, right? Um, and and that's probably what most people are are you or many people use is. Your shutter, let's, let's pretend this is a, um, a, a mirrorless or a DSLR, right? So you press halfway down, it focuses, and then you press all the way down, it takes the, takes the picture. But um, what I do is I actually use the AF button on the back to, um, to start the, the focusing. So like, I don't need to press halfway down 
I use my thumb, press onto the back of the, uh, the AF button, and that focuses. And then I, I put my finger on the shutter release to take the picture. So I've separated the function. Why would you want to do that? Two reasons. If you're shooting sports, you want to, you know, keep your finger on the, the shutter, or sorry, the, uh, the focus button so that it's tracking what you are, are shooting. And then you hold the finger down and it's just like taking the pictures, but the, your thumb is holding the focus button down. So you're continuously focusing. Reason, reason number one, reason number two, you want to change the composition. So, you know, your focus, your little red focus square is in the middle of your picture. If you want to move that person in the frame, what you can do is you put the, the little red square on, on the person, hit the AF button, which, uh, which focuses, then you take your finger off the AF button and then move, move the camera, right? To put them, you know, on like not in the center of the picture, but at the side of the picture. By now pressing the shutter, uh, the shutter button, it's not refocusing. You follow? You know what right, I mean? and you can do that without. You can't. You can't move your location. You can move the camera, but you've yeah. got to stay that same distance the yeah. whole time. So what I, you know, if I'm taking a picture, let's say I'm taking a picture of, uh, you know, my wife standing in front of Niagara Falls, right? What I'm going to do is I'm going to, you know, here I'm this way. I'm going to, you know, smile, honey, and I'm going to um, focus. You know, put the little red square on my on my wife push the AF button to focus. So she's now in focus. And then I literally just go like this so that I've moved her in the frame so I can see the falls. All oh, right, right. Okay, that's, that's a simple example of why you would want to do that. Yeah, okay. It's useful, I've done it, it, it is good. Yeah, it's, you know, there, there are proponents of, you know, a lot, especially sports photographers, you know, it's like everyone's using back button focus. Um, there are people that swear by, you know, that's the wrong way to do it. And it's like, you know, by all means, keep doing what you're doing. But, um, you know, I make a living by doing what I do, how I do it. So yeah. that's one of the, that's literally one of the first things that I change when I uh, get a new camera is I make sure that, you know, like, um, uh, back button focus for sure. In fact, the shutter release button, I turn the focusing off the shutter release button. So it's funny, like I handed my D5 to the guy that was buying it from me, he tried to take a couple of pictures and he's going, it's not working. And uh, cause he was pressing the shutter button and to, to focus and it wasn't focusing. He's like, it's not working. And I'm like, no, it's back button focus. So, you know, hit this button and focus. He took his picture and gave me the money. Okay. Cause it, it, the AF button basically locks it once you do that. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can, you know, you hit the AF button and you, you know, the, the, the lens goes like and, and like focuses. And then um, if you're in AFS mode or you just take your finger off it, doesn't matter if you're in uh, single or continuous, you take your finger off it. So it's not going to change the, the focus settings. And now you just, you know, it's like, okay, I've got you in focus, honey. And then I go like that. So she's now, you know, rule of third, she's over at the side instead of, you know, square in the center of the, uh, the image. But um, if I did not turn off the uh, focus function from the shutter release button, I can do that. And then, you know, I move. And as soon as I go to take the picture, the camera's gonna go and, uh, and refocus now on the falls and my wife will be out of focus. Right. So that's why I separate the function. Yeah. Great. That makes sense? Yep. All right. Awesome. Any other questions? In the chat? Here, I'm gonna, I'm gonna show here for a second. This is a shoot from yesterday. Um, there was uh, some pro soccer players from, um, uh, it was, uh, the Dutch team that were uh, was here with a, a club called Dutch Connections. So these are images straight out of the camera. So if I look here, I've cropped the image and now I look at it 
This is straight out of the camera, harsh lighting. So I'll bring this into Lightroom and bring up the shadows. But like the um, uh, the camera is is locked on her on this kid's eye. It's locked on this kid's eye. So like his eyes are in focus. His eye, even though he's moved, his eyes are in focus. Like the camera is like cheating now. So you can see here. If I go here, like literally the camera is tracking the kid's eye to keep, wow. to keep him critically uh, focused. So this is using your back button focus. I always do. Yeah. 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 Always. Yeah. So cool. if I, you know, this is, uh, this is photo mechanics. So this is a, uh, my photo browser. So this was a session where, you know, there were a couple of thousand pictures taken. Um, so I can quickly go through and rate and call and do all that sort of stuff here. Um, I'm just going to hide some of these. Uh, so, you know, here we come and do, you know, so I can come and do something along these lines. There we go. I would just, you know, bring up the shadow on, on the kid's face. And there you've got the visiting team from um, uh, Rotterdam and uh, the local football club here. Uh, Dutch connections. So this is what they hired me to do stuff for their website. So, um, and social media. So literally like the brand, the brand, Adidas, using the Adidas ball, it was very important. And um, as I said, this is straight out of the camera and the focus, the sharpness is right here on the eye. Even though his eyes are closed, the camera tracks them. Stuff like this. Regarding the tracking, is that something that's only happens with a mirrorless or can, no. would the back button also do it with a DSLR? Well, no, back button. Well, you can do back button with a DSLR. Like I've, I've been using back button focus since my very first DSLR. Um, so all you're doing is just separating the function of focus and shutter release. Um, but the eye tracking um, the eye tracking, there was, there was eye tracking in my, my uh, Z7, which is the one that I'm, that one that I'm, uh, that's broadcasting this. It's not very, it's not good for sports. It's not very fast. It's great for portraits. So I put the camera on a tripod, flip the screen open. I don't need to put the camera to my eye to, you know, move the focus point onto the person's eye. Um, I literally just make sure that the person's in frame and then hit the focus button and it goes whoop, on their eye, but it's not great for, um, uh, for sports. But the cameras that I use now for sports like that took these pictures is an Icon um, Z9. You know, it's like $8,000 um, for the camera, but like the, the eye tracking is like unreal. I literally can track their eye and shoot 120 frames a second in focus. And they're, it's tracking the eye, but you know it's technology, and you pay for it, right? That's it, man. Love it. So that's uh, this is so. If any of you are taking a whole whack of pictures, um, and, and going through them all, um, Photo Mechanic is is the industry standard, um, and I am one of six ambassadors in the world for uh, for camera bits. Um, and the only one that's a sports shooter. So I actually teach um, uh, here. Do, do, come here. Sorry. That sounds like our next workshop. <laughs> uh, yeah. So if, if I come here, uh, training workshops, I actually teach. So I do, I do run workshops. So there's one called Getting Started. So it's, it's one day or one, it's a two hour session. And then this one is a, a four hour session. So this one, streamline your workflow. Um, some of the photographers that have been through mine are like um, the two photographers for the Montreal Canadiens, uh, Major League, NFL, you know, like I teach a lot of professional photographers, even like Getty photographers from around the world. Yeah. So that's that's the advanced one. But if you like to start, it's a two hour workflow. You can learn this stuff yourself by watching YouTube. Um, so if you go to YouTube, um, I have a channel here where there are very 
you know, very short lessons on how to do certain things. Um, but, you know, it took me years um, to learn what I, what I do. Um, exactly. And, you know, you can, you can basically learn the, uh, you know, a su substantial part of what I know about photomechanic in either the two hour or the four hour course. And photomechanics is used for what, like, like organizing your photos, right? It's not really an editing tool. No, it's, it's not editing beyond, um, like I can go here and I can change the crop. Right. Yeah. Um, and then I can, you know, I can also change, you know, straighten it out here, for example. Um, and then I can, you know, I can look at it here, but I can also do things like um, edit the metadata. Right. Yeah, the metadata. Do all of that sort of stuff, and if I want, I can now send it directly to. Um, so I can send it directly to my Smug Monk site, Twitter, Zenfolio. Um, I can send it to if it was you know an assignment for Golf Canada. See, I'm logged into Golf Canada here as as me. I can go here. You know, when I shoot. Uh, 2022 amateur championships so like this one i shot the next gen ontario championships for them so i just literally i can take the images i can crop them and capture them in photo mechanic and pump them up to their website um, i have done it before where i took a picture took pictures of kylie moss if you recognize that name world record holder medalist at the olympics I photographed her diving and then, you know, part way of her first lap. I had three images captioned, edited, and posted to Instagram. By the time she walked over to her coach um, after the race, so, you know, drying off, I was talking to her coach and he was going through the images and inspecting her, um, her technique. Crazy. So Crazy. It's, it's fast. Crazy. So, yeah, yeah. it's good. Any other questions? I just had one question um, for Jeff. Um, this might be dumb. How does this program that you just showed us compare to Lightroom? Uh, good question. Excellent question. So I go here and I say, I want to edit these two pictures. I drop them down here. I drop them into Lightroom and it imports it into Lightroom. Or what I can do is I can say, edit this with um, Lightroom. Photoshop, Bridge. So this is a file browser. So it's not like, not like Lightroom where you're bringing it into a catalog. Um, all this is here that you're seeing here, like this, uh, this is a navigator. It's really the same view as, um, as this, right? Like you're seeing the same drives, but you see here, this is, you know, you're seeing a text file name um, whereas in photo mechanic, I'm seeing here's the text text file name. This is the, the folder name because I've set it to show me that. Um, but it also shows me the actual thumbnail and I can scale this down, you know, so I can, if I'm looking for pictures, I want to show, you know, the, I don't have any three star pictures, but let's say, let's say I like this one. I like it enough. I'm going to call it a three star. So I'm going to make, make it a, a three star. Now I can filter out. So these are all the images. I'm going to filter out my, um, there you go. So there, that's, you know, a three star. So what I would do when I'm doing a shoot is uh, my assistant would go through and do all the, the, uh, cap, uh, the selections. One or better is something I'm going to keep. Two is even better. Three goes to social media. Four is like probably the best of the day. And five is goes to my portfolio. Like it's the best picture I've taken. So, um, and to do that, like you can see how quickly I can go through, like these are big files. And you can see how quickly I'm going through them. Try doing that in Lightroom. Yeah, wow. mm -hmm. So this is not instead of Lightroom. This is for me to figure, okay, I, you know, I like this picture. I'm going to crop it like, you know, something like this and then move on. And then I'm going to take that picture and drop it in. You know, what I could do is say, hide all my zeros. 
one or better, select them all, drop them into Lightroom. And now instead of bringing a thousand images into uh, Lightroom, including all the you know out of focus and bad pictures, I'm just bringing the, the, the keepers. Okay. Yeah. So okay. mass, and there's all sorts of power in terms of um, renaming, um, creating folders, renaming the files. So even you see here, using um, variables here. So like when I'm shooting the swim meet, I literally shoot the swimmer, put the card in the card reader, and it will rename the file to the person's name automatically. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's that's the part that um, my first event ever um, as a pro, uh, it was for Skate Canada and we created 85,000 images over four days. And I was under contract to name every file after the, the skater. It took me three weeks. I s figured out how to do, you use photo mechanic and then do the, uh, the variables. And we did an event for them for, with 100,000 images. That sorting time was zero. It was all automatic. Time is money. Yeah. Time yeah. Is money. So that's... Uh, um, that's why, um, sorry, if I go here, go here, that's why, like, you know, um, that's why I can shoot for these guys. And literally, like when I'm shooting for Golf Canada, I can take a picture of the leader Sunday morning on his tee shot in the first hole. Before the guy hits his second shot, I can have it on my Smug Mug site, Golf Canada's photo shelter site, Twitter, and Dropbox before he hits his second shot. Wow. So that's that's very important, um, you know, one, so you spend less time in front of the computer. Yeah, um, shooting. You know, right, if, you, if you're a hobbyist and you go out and shoot like, you know, some street festival, the last thing you want to do is come and now spend like eight hours in, you know, in front of your computer. Yeah. So you know, yeah. we, can make, we can make it faster and automate um you know anyway so that's uh, a question yeah jeff, jeff it's laura um yeah. can you just talk about the file size are, are these these are all raw um no um i for years shot um uh i for years shot raw only because uh, you know the d4 the d5 they're a little flat so it needed some vibrancy sharpening. I needed to move the white and the black uh, points to, to get the proper exposure. So I would shoot raw. Um, I'm now shooting, like I shot all of the RBC Canadian Open in JPEG and I shot all of this in JPEG because as you can see here, like the colors are phenomenal in this. I, it may not be coming through on your end with, uh, you know, through Zoom and, but like the colors are like spectacular. The only thing I'm gonna do in Lightroom is bring up the shadows because it was very harsh. Um, like this was around 11 o'clock in the morning, I think, 11.30, yeah, 11.30. So the sun was, you know, almost directly above. Um, but I'm, I do a lot more of my shooting now in JPEG and that's because the, uh, the Z9 is just a, you know, it's, it's incredible and can can you talk about your your storage um system do you, or, or do you store all your files on external mm -hmm. drives on the cloud yeah so when um uh so what i do is when i ingest so i bring it off the card it goes onto um an external drive and i've got 20, 32, 36. I've got 36 terabytes of external storage here. Um, but because Photo Mechanic looks at um, the embedded JPEG, it doesn't need, like Lightroom will, will have to render every image. Um, Photo Mechanic looks at the embedded JPEG, so it's like wicked fast. That's why I can, um, that's why I can literally like go here, even if these were rods, um, I can go. So the file size for these, 
Um, th these are 19 meg uh, files, roughly. But with raw, um, it's a 49 megapixel camera, so the, the raw files are massive. Did I, was I shooting raw here? Let's see. I might have been shooting raw here. Let's see. No. Yeah. So anyway, file size, you know, it's going to depend on your camera. Um, depending on the conditions, I will now shoot um, JPEG. If I'm shooting swimming, I'm because the it, you know higher ISO, I'm going to be shooting um, uh, raw indoors. Jeff, is there some kind of fee to access this program, or is it a bot program? How does the process work? Uh, for a photo mechanic? Yes. So camera bits. So to buy it, it is a one-time fee of $139 US. So it's not, you know, to me, and I've told them this, I save, I save like literally hundreds of dollars a day in terms of, you know, the, the amount of work that it saves me. Oh, yeah. um, but if you come back here, like, like, for example, so this is their website. As I said, this is, it's the industry standard um, for sports and photojournalists. And, and there me. you are. That's me. So I'm. Um, He's your twin brother. Yeah. Yeah. One program. He, yeah, he's, uh, he's a lot thinner than I am now. <laughs> but, uh, you know, if I come back here to training, 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 training. So this is the director of uh, marketing for these guys. And, um, you know, in this video, he basically says he's the most advanced photo mechanic user in the, the, that we, you know, we know. Um, he now, I taught him, actually. <laughs> This is my workflow to go through um, uh, when he shoots music festivals. He now uh, uses my workflow. Uh -huh. But um, yeah, oh. it's changed my life. That's, that's yeah, no, no doubt. I'm talking about 100,000 images. And, it, it sounds um, like a reasonable cost for a program, actually, because I'm sure it'll pay off in a few assignments. Oh, yeah. and, and attendees of my workshop receive a 15% discount on their photo mechanic license. So, you know, it's not huge, but, you know, it's $139 uh, Canadian um, to go through my, uh, my getting started workshop, but you save 115% uh, of 139 US. So you save like 20 bucks um, off the license. What's the difference between the plus and the, the six? The plus has a catalog. So the catalog, you know, similar to Lightroom, mm. but the catalog here is far more powerful and far faster. Okay. So now when I want to do a search, um, I do my search in Photo Mechanic. Yeah. I, find, I, I find my image and then I come here and then I just say like reveal in, um, uh, reveal in Finder. So yeah. it tells me where it is. Then I go back into Lightroom to, you know, to, edit you know whatever um i don't bother searching in uh, lightroom so that's the difference is this tab right here and that's the uh, the catalog um so very powerful search features so you know you can sort like i want um i want to find you know you can see the numbers here right like a you know yellow trash superior yeah you know i've got all these different tags on them so I want to find a picture taken, um, you know, here, I, I want to pick, I want to find a picture that I took in 2022 yeah. that is a three star or better and has, um, you know, the following metadata. So it's going to be Toronto Pan Am Center swimming oh. backstroke. And I that information here, click, boom, there are my pictures. Uh, that's Why doing that in Lightroom? Good luck. Oh yeah, no, it you know what I <laughs> I have a NAS drive. So I what I do is we do it by year. Yeah. I do it by the uh BIA. Yeah. Or sometimes an event or organization. Yeah. And then I put the then I put it by date. 
Yeah. So what I do here, it's for a example, little easier. This is, yeah. but it would be better here. Like I've got it by um, by sport. Yeah. So I'm gonna go here, right there. Like, but it would be not. It would be neat to be able to say, okay, it's uh, you know, like if it was a certain event, I could add those extra items to it. Well, it, you know, here's here's the thing. What what you do is when you're um, when you're ingesting. Yeah. Right? So there's um, you know, I'm gonna use these variables to create the folder name. Yeah. I'm gonna use these variables to create the file name, and then I'm gonna go here to my uh, my template. And Even let's say like, I'm shooting, um, let's say I'm shooting a soccer game. Hmm. I put in the two names, uh, the name of you know this team and that team. Mm. All the rest is going to be the city, the state, the month, the, the event, the photo credit, all of that stuff mm. is all automatically put in here. So I might put in, you know, that it's soccer and it might be, mm. you know, um, men's, something like that. Yeah. So these keywords would automatically be added. So location, event, so these variables, like yeah. city here would be Toronto. Right. So all of that would be applied to every image automatically. So now when I come back here and search for it, there you so go. Like what that another picture of Taylor Ruck, that, that swimmer. I don't remember what year I took it. Yeah. But I could search for Ruck swimming, five stars, boom. Oh. Right. Because I've got lots of pictures of Taylor. She's four Olympic medals. So I've got lots of pictures of her. But I want the, the five star picture. I don't remember what year I took it. Yeah. Um, I just enter all of that stuff in here. You can create collections so you can save your searches. Yeah. And um, so, full so I disclosure, could... I didn't, when they came out with the, the six, version six, I didn't think I needed it because I used Lightroom. Mm. Um, I was wrong. <laughs> um it is I, I don't use the search feature in uh lightroom i use photo mechanic for that for any okay. searching um but the full disclosure part is i didn't pay for the license i i get my licenses now from uh from uh, oh. camera bits yeah. i paid for my initial license but subsequently now i get all my stuff free from them yeah well it's earning the earning that spot <laughs> Yeah. So, um, yeah. So like when I teach, um, when I teach, for example, like, you know, I give to all the students, like you're doing a, um, you know, start with this basic ingest, you're doing a two team, like a football, baseball, hockey, you know, do this one, mm. you, do, you know, you're doing two teams, but you're separating it by period or inning or quarter or whatever right? so you you save all that yeah oh, yeah. okay so i'm doing oh. i'm doing a like i'm saving the template yeah that's what I mean. a one person um uh photo shoot yeah so i'm taking i'm you know creating a folder based on the date and the yeah. event and the event is going to be here there's um my one person there you go susan smith or i could put you know janice whatever, right? Uh, taking the, the picture and I'm going to be taking it at uh, BMO Field, right? So now I close this, I do my shoot, I put the card in and it automatically, automatically ingests incremental images. So the ones that haven't already been ingested then automatically dismounts my card. So I literally put the card in, wait for this, this thing down here to turn green and take the card out. So my files are named, my folders created, my metadata is added. So my problem is <laughs> I walk a lot, so that might not work that part. I just I have to, I have to still separate it. Mm. Wait, sorry, I, I uh, I'd have to separate it by the sections of the city. Because sometimes I cross over a few. <laughs> oh, so you are shooting I, in north york and then you're shooting in downtown is that what you mean uh well no i i separate even closer than that like i will uh bloor court bloordale um bloor yorkville annex let's say yeah yeah that type of thing. there's i i you know what, what how i would do that yeah is 
Um, I would do um, So just put it in the streams. So what I'm doing here, so it's going to create a folder automatically with the date. So this, will, if I was to shoot today, it would give 22-07- uh, whatever the day is today. Yeah. Uh, it's 15. Event would be Toronto photo shoot, whatever you, you know, whatever. Yeah. And then it would create subfolders. And then you could literally, you know, you, you literally shoot in your camera, you shoot, you know, Young and Blue or, or whatever, you know, the- Oh, uh, like I could- Honda Square would be in folder 100. Yeah. Um, you know, the Royal Ontario Museum would be folder 101. Mm -hmm. And then you create a spreadsheet, you know, before you go shoot with those things in there. You put your card in, it would automatically do that, create all the folders, add the correct metadata, all automatically because that's exactly what I do when I shoot a swing meet. Oh, that's the a... exact same scenario. So I go here, and so here I've got an event. And the reason I don't do the, the date sort dash is because my event will be like maybe four or five days long. Yeah. So I create one folder for the year and then the event name. So XYZ swim meet. And then this would be the folder number and then the replacement of the folder number. It's called a code lookup or a code code replacement. Yeah. So this would say 101 because I want to keep it in order. 101 Taylor Ruck. And then the image would be called Sport Dad underscore Taylor Ruck automatically. Mm -hmm. But you could do the exact same thing, but instead of Taylor Ruck, it would be Young Dundas Square. Yeah. I gotta do something. Uh, sorry, Jeff. Does this also work for video or strictly just for uh, like? A it table? it will do some browsing. Um, of the video. I'm not a video guy. Okay. They do, like, you can see the thumbnails, and then you can take here and edit your thumb, like, here, and then you can push out to your, your um, uh, video editing software. Like, I've defined these are the three apps that I want. Okay, so there's a crossover plugin, I guess, built yeah. in. Yeah, because okay. you can go here. Uh, let's see, where is it? It's okay as long as it can do all figure out sometime. It's fine. Yeah, it's uh, I can. Yeah, because my husband would like this. I'm trying to remember <laughs> where. My husband would like me to sort out better. Yeah, I, I like literally, one of the guys that sat in on my uh, my present on one of my workshops is the director of sports photography for Getty Images. Yeah. So, like, <laughs> you you don't get a guy that sees more um, many more pictures than him. No. I'm just going to say that's uh, impressive credentials right there from Getty. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So yeah, I signed with Getty a year ago. The uh, the most impressive one, a uh, uh, guy that I've worked with, one of the other instructors, is, uh, was 17 years as a director of photography for uh, Sports Illustrated before Sports Illustrated fired their entire staff. Um, I'm pretty sure that guy knows exposure to f-stops by now. <laughs> yeah. Well, he he used to review two hundred thousand images a week to pick eighty for the magazine. Oh my god! <laughs> Crazy. Yeah. So um, yeah, very very nice stuff. And very. Talk about a critical eye. Where where was it? I'll show you this. Oh yeah, I'm so sure that I was that. in Colorado shooting last, you know, literally fifty two weeks ago. Shot this picture. And you saw the video where the guy was, you know, he waited and he, he, he missed the peak action. I timed it like I was, I practiced and I knew what to look for. So like he's accelerating, you see the, the dirt being kicked up here. So, you know, he's like hit the gas. He hasn't planted his foot yet. And the, the front wheel is about three inches off the dirt. He looked mm -hmm. and said, everything is perfect about this image, but you should have gotten lower. My camera was on the ground. Like I literally pushed it to the ground and um, I said, the, I was on the ground. Like I wasn't even, you know, looking through it. I had the video, uh, the, the screen flipped up. I said to get any lower, I would have needed to dig a hole. And he said, why didn't you dig a hole? So critical. Yeah. Maybe it's because you're not Orson Welles shooting his films. You should dig holes for that. <laughs> yeah. You know, in hindsight, 
there was a shovel just out of the screen because we kept uh, fixing the berm right after you know several passes. Yeah. We shovel it back. Next time. Next time. Well, There's a question just about backing up photos. Like, do you, how do you back up stuff? Oh, do I back up? Yeah. So what I do is, um, um, it, it, you know, I teach the uh, in in the workflow stuff here. Do, 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 do. Open we have a NAS drive. That's what my husband organized for me. Oops. Yeah, but if, if, you, if your NAS, you know, if, if uh, the problem with the NAS, it gets stolen, you're, you're cooked. Oh, yeah. Well, what he does, it's actually on a computer, the NAS, yeah. and then he downloads it to another one and takes it to work. Yeah, see what I do, I do a couple of things. So yeah. here is it here. This is what I teach in the workflow. Yeah. So here's here's the one computer workflow. Yeah. And just goes we on the laptop. We don't have the screen job. There you go. Oh, All right. So from the computer comes into photo mechanic on my laptop, goes yeah. into the internal SSD. It backs up to two places. One is backblaze. <laughs> And then goes to Dropbox. So Dropbox is a bit more temporary. Yeah. Um, so I literally have two off-site backups. Yeah. And when I ingest, it goes to the internal drive and then a secondary SSD. Yeah. In case my computer breaks, gets lost, whatever, um, uh, following a shoot. So I literally, my computer and this external drive, separate bags. So that you know, if I have a da any damage, I still have the image. Yeah. This gets backed up to two different locations, and then I bring it into Lightroom, and then um, goes into um, SmugMug. So the the JPEGs actually go up to SmugMug. So I end up with um, my local my local drive, or sorry, my external drive on my computer, Backblaze, Dropbox, and SmugMug. So I have four copies. Yeah. yeah. Well, there is a cloud. Part to the NAS, I, he's he's got it oh like VPN. So if I if I am somewhere, I can upload it to yeah, it. Yeah, but but what that is is it's still storing it in one location, and you're yeah. accessing it from remotely. What I do, yeah. like if my house burnt down, yeah, um, you know if we have like, one number of years ago we were robbed, so like yeah. they stole a whole bunch of stuff. Yeah. Um, so, you know, fortunately I had everything on the, on the cloud and backed up on the cloud yeah. and two, like right now, um, our house is, has, has been raised to the, like it's to the ground. Like our house is, is now an empty shell of a basement. Um, I don't have to worry about where my images are because they're backed up to the cloud. Yeah. Oh well, yeah. So even if I have any failure of my <laughs> external drives that they're sitting, you know, behind my screen. Yeah. If that fails, I just get the uh, get the restore from so Backblaze. Backblaze, how much is that one? What's that one like? This is curious. Backblaze. Never heard of it. That's why. I curious. Well, it's always good to know these places. So I've heard of people like my husband has helped other people recover their photos from hard drives. Yeah, because they have not backed it up. To do that. Yeah, because they have not backed it up. Yeah, so backblaze one hundred and thirty dollars every two years. Oh, that's pretty cheap. Unlimited, so 80, 80 bucks a year. Yeah. But since I started using backblaze, I've not had to buy any additional storage. So how how many gigabytes with that, or um, terabytes? Personal is unlimited. Oh, okay. I should tell my husband. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Be careful though, because a NAS, because it's it's unlimited for the personal backup. It's unlimited for your attached storage. And some oh, no. NAS Wait. devices are not considered attached storage. They're considered a, a, a network device. Yeah. So you just have to be careful. Yeah. So what I, I would have to do it, I'd have to do it from the computer, the regular computer. Yeah. Yeah, because I always upload it to the regular computer, and yeah. then my husband will back it up every once in a while, and then yeah, it, it needs a we do. Imagine it. imagine doing like a you know you do a shoot for uh, for you know you shoot the the Canadian Open golf tournament. Yeah. And 
you know, two days later, your computer fails, you lose all your drives because your husband didn't back it up in the last two days. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Uh, mine, I've set it, it's automated. And now yeah. I set it, I test it once a year. Yeah. Just, you know, just in case. Yep. But like, here's my, uh, my backblaze stuff. That's actually cool. Yeah, exactly. So I I now have it's cheaper than that's cheaper than Google. <laughs> I have two point eight million files for um, 18, 19 terabytes. Yeah. Oh, that's so a nineteen problem. terabytes oh, to two point eight million files. Yeah. Um, and it's automatic. So if I ingest an image. Mm then automatically like you know a minute or two later you'll see that it, it starts backing it up here it's all in the background i set it once and i forget it is there a mobile like can you attach a mobile to it like in, you know, if you want to back up your like as i multi um or i sometimes get my stuff sent to my thing i download it to the phone rather than to my hard drive too. yeah so that what, is what I do is um, I have two devices um, yeah. on my Backblaze plan. I have my iMac mm -hmm. and my MacBook Pro. Okay. So both of them are automatically done, right? So like okay. $130 for two years, but it's, I think, you know, the additional license is a little bit less. They give you a break for additional multiple. Uh, yeah. Um, but when I, um, I also have, you asked about the phone. So when I have something on my phone, it automatically feeds up to my Smug Mug website. So okay. like I take a picture, I don't need to worry about, you know, your iCloud is full, right? Like, yeah. Worry about that. It just automatically goes up uh, into a private gallery on Smug Mug and Smug Mug's unlimited. So okay. I have, you know, literally 50,000 personal images, probably every picture I've ever taken with my phone. Yeah. Is in that. Smug mug and uh, this this is this is my smug like this is my smug mug site right yeah. like there's Zenfolio there's dozens of them but smug it's mug and blaze blaze back blaze back right so smug mug is is this one and it's made for photographers yeah so I signed up um you know, so I signed up and I based me yeah, out here, the plans. So $9 a month for your basic. Yeah, it's okay. Like, look at that unlimited full resolution storage, not your raw files. That's, that's, it won't do the raw JPEGs. files unless you pay for the plan that will do raw. Yeah. But $9 a month. So 75 bucks a year, US. Mm -hmm. um, and similarly, um like the the photo mechanic stuff where you get a discount i can also give you a discount um on smog month as an affiliate like i'm got a discount code to, to share back up the backup yeah well uh, you have to you, you really do because oh, yeah, like my husband literally here one you know i have a a photo it comes here it splits here and here. So I now have three copies of it, four, five, six. So I end up with six copies and now I can uh, format my card and uh, delete it off this external SSD. So I end up with one, 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 two, three copies. And then four, the fourth is the JPEG. Yeah. So take a raw image, boom, 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 boom. Here. So do you do you take raw and JPEG large? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Just curious. I I've just been doing raw, but I do backup JPEG small, but probably should do large. Yeah, I, you know, but it's a philosophical question. What are you shooting? Like if I'm shooting, I shot soccer yesterday. The JPEGs are like like from that camera. I can't speak uh, more highly than. Uh, like the, the Nikon Z9. Yeah, I'm using you, you'd Z6. expect for, you yeah. know, it's 7,000 plus tax. Yeah, you'd I use the Z6. Z, Z, yeah, I've got the Z7 and uh, sold my D5 yesterday, yeah. two Z9s. And I, I did not shoot JPEG um, until I got the Z9. Yeah. 
Yeah. In D5, it would have shot raw, everything raw. Well, Z6 supposed to be more video, or I haven't used it for video yet, but it's supposed to be a little bit. Yeah, better. It's, it, like, it's, a, it's a good, like, you know, it's, it's, it's good. I haven't shot. The, the Z7 is also uh, incredible image quality, but it's not yeah. as fast. And the, the focus. Well, you, you have that focus part. <laughs> Yeah, the focus is not uh, not because uh, I, I actually shot what I did the Canon the Canon uh, road trip. Yeah, and I shot with a Z three just to try it out, and I was like, "This is so much easier." Yeah, <laughs> it was a little easier. I think I would have been tempted by Canon if I didn't already have the Z six. Yeah, so like here's you know like I I've got the whole. You know, here's a two two yeah. year workflow. Like this is all part of the the stuff that I teach. You know, like how to properly, um, you know, the proper workflow. So that, yeah. you know, it's not only is it fast, but it's reliable. Yeah. Um, and you know, fault tolerant. So any method that requires a spouse to remember to back up stuff is <laughs> dangerous. Yeah. Well, you know, it's, it's okay if you're a hobbyist, but like yeah. I do my living. And, you know, like if I, if I tell Golf Canada, I'm sorry that, you know, the, the pictures from the, the final round, um, yeah. you know, my, my hard disk failed and, uh, you know, forgot to back it up or hadn't backed it up yet. Like yeah. it's all automatic. I put the card in the card reader and it literally goes to, um, goes off to like five, five different locations. So how do you get it to do that? Like, is it programming or did you use something to do that or you're just photo, it's all photo mechanic okay. so i photo mechanic does the ingest and then goes to the two locations so yeah so photo mechanic does that. this takes oh. it off the card and puts it in the two locations and then backblaze is set to run automatically i set it like seven years ago yeah and um dropbox automatically because this it i my destination is a Dropbox folder, so it syncs from here to here. Yeah. Automatic. I set it once. As I said, I test it once a year, but I set it once, and all I do is I put the card in the card reader, and, and like this happens automatically, then this happens automatically. Oh, okay. Now, oh, okay. So the first thing I do when I come home from a shoot is I open up my laptop and this synchronization happens while I'm, you know, grabbing a sandwich, maybe a shower. And by the time I come back, it's, it's backed up to back lays and here. Yeah. So I have my copies and now I can start doing all my work. Uh, but like, like I said, this is the stuff that I teach professional photographers around the world. So this is kind of some of the advanced stuff. Yeah. They, the purpose of today's was, you know, kind of get you off of P mode. Yeah, no, but so this, this is this is like 400 yeah, yeah, yeah. university stuff. Yeah, what I was teaching earlier, the like the, the get out of P mode was, yeah, you know, so but as I said, like this is like stream, like this is my advanced course, and you yeah. can start to see, like, here's the you know, it starts to get complex, right? When I get into hot codes and right, like, oh, I know David Crow. <laughs> I went to university with him. Uh, so like here I'm shooting a music festival. Yeah. Um, so now I'm, you know, the caption would be Dan from Dan City performs on stage at the event. Uh, and it would do the, the lookup and the replacement. So this would be David Crowey from Los Angeles plays on the Montana stage uh, at the whatever music festival. So like uh, this is pretty complex stuff. Yeah. And if I go here um let's look at uh the most complicated one i built um so like city state month day weight class first name or fighter one first name fighter one nickname fighter one last name versus fighter two first name nickname last name fighting during event at location credit like these are all variables and you just fill in the fighter names and the referee and the, you know, Hi, John. all of that stuff in a spreadsheet. And then it just does the lookup and automatically, um, automatically, uh, you know, adds all this information. I think I have it here. But uh, for Instagram, 
that doesn't automatically go into the alt text, does it? You have to put that in yourself. I, I don't know. Don't think so. Yeah. Yeah. Curious. Yeah, I don't know. It was that advanced yet? <laughs> no. Yeah. Anyway, we've gotten we've gotten to the top of the hour. So if there are no more questions for me, <laughs> we're, Jeff, we're, we're only going to we, we thought we were, we were only going to go for half an hour. <laughs> we had questions. Any other questions? I said, if we have questions, hopefully it's, it becomes a discussion. Yeah. Oh, no, because the, the, the storage part is uh, the beast. The eye opening the beast for itself. a few. Yeah. The beast so I thought, yeah, I need that workflow. Yeah. Well, the good news is that the Zoom is recording. So, yeah, uh, so I can show it to him tomorrow so you guys can go back to it. To I'm doing the get out. We live the magic. Well, and then, and then, you know, a shameless plug for uh, workshops. Yeah. So there are a couple of things. I do one on one sessions. Yeah. So, like, you spend an hour with me, I can fix all that stuff for you in, in yeah. terms of workflow and backup and all of that stuff. Uh, no yeah. disrespect to your husband, but that method is. No, because... no, he would, he would like probably like thank you. <laughs> and the workshops, you know, like you sign up here. Especially. Right and and like we, I've got uh, I've got a couple so the getting started I've got one next week oh. and the advanced one is the beginning of August and then there's other ones coming up after that yeah maybe in the fall I finally get it <laughs> like Fine. I I've had like there was a guy Matt Cohen probably the best rodeo photographer in the world yeah. he took my workshop and he said I just saved him three hours a day yeah so. You know, two hundred and thirty-nine dollars for uh, you know, it was one hundred and eighty-three in the state, so two hundred and thirty-nine dollars Canadian. Yeah, three hours a day. Oh yeah, that's um, a lot. Yeah. 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 Anyway. Cool. Well, thanks, Jeff. Events, but we appreciate this. My pleasure. Any, so other, any other questions? No, we we did get started late because of some reason. The... Mm. But that was great. Yeah. Thank you very much. It's very informative. Cool guys. Yeah, well, thanks again, Jeff. Much. Maybe we'll do something else in the future. Yeah. Any final thoughts, Jeff? Uh, no, I, I, you know, as I said, um, hopefully this was uh, informative. It gave you some food for thought. To... Yeah. No, because I, I think what I, I think you touched on it in the. Um, in the YouTube was talking about the shutter speed and that. Yeah. And I think we were talking about it last week, I think with Subin. So it was kind of interesting because it was like, because I do get that. Well, I got a kid who's very fast. So <laughs> yeah. I would like get to a point where I can take a photo of him and not have that, you know, yeah. blur happening if I can avoid some of it. Yeah. Well, hopefully that gives you uh yeah you know, some food for thought and, uh, you know, go, go play with your camera over the weekend. And once you, um, you know, once you figure out, you know, once you get an understanding of the shutter speed, like the exposure triangle, yeah. you know, I, I laugh, I get people all the time. Oh, you know, are you, are you shooting in sport mode? It's like, I have never owned a camera that had sport mode. <laughs> I know I used to, I used to use that before. Yeah. Well, I'll, also, I would what use we're it because, doing is setting a faster shutter speed. That's yeah. all it's doing. Well, it's because I was up, you know, you're up, up in a tour bus. Sometimes the sport mode was handier. Yeah. For, for fast shots. Yeah. But I literally have never owned a camera that had a sport mode. Yeah. yeah. So, um, you know, I, I, I always shoot fully, uh, fully manual. Yeah. Um, auto, you know, autofocus, but I control what's, how the autofocus is, uh, is, it really it really helps with that back led yeah i don't know what'll happen if that ever failed on me because that's i have a like because with my eyesight I, there's no way i can do manual so yeah it's, just can't do i can't attempt to try that but unless it's a big a big one could 11 to 14 or something like that yeah mm -hmm. but um well, Yep. All right, so Paul, back back to you, and uh, thank you yeah, for those that, uh, that joined. Hopefully, this was uh, 
Uh, yeah. This is eye opening and g- gave you some ideas. And that's it. That's what it's about. Uh, the Zoom link will probably be posted tomorrow. So if you want to go back and find find something specific, uh, just click click the link and you can check it out. So it's all good. And make, make sure you follow SportDadCA on Instagram. Make sure that's where I, exactly you need to. You need to. Cool, Jeff. Well, thanks again, man. Really appreciate the time. Well, my pleasure. Yeah. There you go. That's me. Yeah, I think I, I should have it from the last one. Yeah. Yep. Cool. I am. Should we call it? Is that, is that, Probably should. Is that a wrap? I gotta go. See some of you Sunday, I guess, eh? Yes. Well, Kim, oh, you'll yeah. be there. I know that. Yeah, I kind of have to show <laughs> up. I still got to remember to look at the website before I leave. Yeah. So I know where, well, I like, I know one item because they released it today. It'll be, It'll be fun. It'll be a good time. Kismet stuff. But yeah. I'm just like looking forward is like what those questions for the trivia is going to be like. Mm. Because I guess, because I wonder what she's yeah. going to ask. I yeah. just want to see people's reactions. Yeah. <laughs> That'll be fun. There's music and everything. Yeah. All right. We'll see you Sunday. Yeah. Hey, thanks for jumping on. Yeah. See you next time. Thanks, Jeff. Bye.